Um, question from uh, King of Cheddar Cheese. Mm. Um, so do you think that Boris has done more or less harm? Or, sorry, do you think Boris would do more or less harm as an MP, as you did as London Mayor? <laughs> um, well, actually, I think there was a picture of Boris Johnson after he'd been mayor for five years standing in front of his desk, and everything was as I'd left it on the day I walked out, even the little pot with the pens. I mean, Boris doesn't... I mean, he hasn't set a big new right-wing agenda. If you talk to some of the, the real hardline Tories, they're acutely disappointed. He, I mean, he's broadly carried on with what I started. And I think that will be the problem if he becomes Prime Minister. It will be drift. And we've had too much of that. You know, a, we need a clear new direction. Investment in infrastructure, building homes, modern high-speed rail links. What we should have, I, mean, I proposed this in 1983, every home, uh, educational institute and business linked up with a proper fibre optic cable system. I mean, if you're in somewhere like South Korea or Taiwan, the speed with which you can access the internet is just stunning compared with what we've got here. Um, and until you put that in, we won't get the jobs that come on the back of a really good internet system. Okay. Question from Robin. He wants to know about your time with Hugo Chavez. Oh. I, mean, I love Hugo Chavez because, I mean, once again, the press demonised him as a dictator, but he, he won about every election except one referendum he lost. Um, and he, I mean, he was demonised because every previous government for at least 50 or even longer years before, the oil of Venezuela, the benefits had gone to the oil companies, not the people of Venezuela. He stopped all that. So suddenly everyone had health care. I mean, I, the first time I went to Venezuela, just after I lost the election to Boris and to meet Chavez, the thing that struck me as you met Venezuelans, there were all these people your age or my age with braces on their teeth. And you realise this was the first time Venezuelans have been able to get dentistry, let alone healthcare, um, and everyone getting to school. Now, I think the mistake that, that Chavez made was they sat on quite a vast pile of money and I, I said to their finance minister, my wife, I said, it, it, big investment in infrastructure. Because that's key. If you actually look now, there's a consensus emerging economists that a successful economy, the one factor that outweighs all the others put together is the level of investment. And the investment private companies do, but also that the state does in putting in the roads, the rail, the, infra, the, the internet access, all of that. Um, do those together, your economy will boom. Did they listen to you? No, he didn't listen to me. I mean, sadly, I, he'd invited me to go over to tell them the, their candidate for mayor of Caracas what I thought he should do. Um, but, I mean, he lost, I'm a right-winger one, so <laughs> none of that happened. Um, who are the politicians that you respect? And these could be ones from the past, but yeah. you know, I, more relevant for the well, present. I do respect, and I like Ian Miliband, as we said, as we said previously, yeah. obviously this is not the John <laughs> Smith. I loved, and um, Michael Foot was a wonderful, really nice guy. That I think he had problems coming to terms with the sort of you know the, the chaos in the Labour Party at the time. Um, the people I, I'm, I suppose, the American president I most respect is Roosevelt, who lifted America out of the depression. Tragically, he died before he could make a better America after the war. Lincoln, clearly, another one. I think Lenin. A lot of people would dismiss Lenin as a monster. But the choice that the Russian people faced back in 1917 wasn't Lenin or a modern Western democracy. It was Lenin or a fascist military that you know, would have um, been even worse than the Tsar. Um, there's a lot of people in history I respect. Very hard, actually, if you're in day-to-day -day politics to find many that you... I mean, so much backstabbing and, and you know, undermining goes on. It's hard to sort of fall in love with many of your colleagues in Parliament. OK. Um so today, mm. um, political leaders are been gathering mm. in Wales mm. um, for the NATO summit, the latest NATO summit. President Obama mm. is one of those who is there. Who? Do, well, what do you think of President Obama? What do you think of him as a person? Well, him I'm as a president. A, I woke up to get the election result the night he won back in 2008. I remember really filled with the sort of hope I hadn't filled felt about an American president since, it, since Kennedy, um, the two Kennedys were assassinated. And 
I mean, he's done some good things, but I think it's very disappointing. He's broadly gone along with the interests of corporate America. And it's quite revealing, actually. Every other previous candidate for president had actually relied on the state funding mechanism that was in place. He decided to drop that and, and get all these huge corporate donations. So he's not really changed very much. I mean, he's, there have been a lot worse, but he's nothing like as bad as George W. Bush. But, you know, and also, one has to say... I, it's probably a, a big reason why <laughs> I, I know you would say that, and yeah. everyone, everyone so, thought no, you would know you'd say that. So, so I yeah. mean, I, I, an acute disappointment. And the things he's saying now, I mean, we don't need to have a war in Ukraine. I mean, NATO just has to say, we are not going to expand right up to Russia's border by bringing Ukraine in. I mean, I, I, I do a radio program on LBC, and we had the Ukrainian ambassador on. And I was saying, look, you can defuse all this. You have to say two things. We won't join NATO, so Russia won't worry about having American military bases right on its border there. And you'll have some sort of federal structure like we've got with Scotland and Wales, so that eastern region will have some degree of confidence they're not just going to be sort of treated as second-class citizens. And they won't do that. And that's, that, that's the cause of the problem, not, not Putin. Putin can't want to take over Ukraine. It's an economic basket case. OK, so we've got some good questions coming in from viewers. Thank you. If you want to comment, if you uh, <coughs> feel there's something that you want to ask Ken, this is your chance to do so. Um, another question, this one from Diligence Music. Um, is there enough protest and anarchy around at the moment on the streets? Are you seeing enough? Are you, well, should there be more? For some of my generation who saw the, the 60s with demonstrations all over the world, some of them bringing governments down, you know, um, one would have to say no. But then, as I said earlier on the programme, none of those really made a lasting change. If you want, I mean, you only ever have a revolution when society is on the point of collapse, like Russia in 1917, China in, in 49, a Cuba, where basically Cuba was being run by the mafia eh, rather than Cuban people. And when people have got nothing to lose but their life, they'll take that gamble. But as long as they've got anything else to lose, they won't. So you've got to work through the system, and that mainly means getting people to know the truth. I think it's, it's getting out now. I think mean, more people are picking up, particularly the young, about just how unfair Britain's become. I mean, Almost all the increase in wealth that we've had in the last 20 years has gone to the top 1%. I mean, you actually look at the, the income levels. People at the top are richer than they've ever been, but the vast majority of ordinary people are struggling just to put food on the table. Mm. Question from, I think it's Nivan. Um Sorry if I got that wrong. Um, a question about Julian Assange. Mm. Um, would you free him from the Ecuadorian embassy? Oh, yes. I mean, I, mean, I think there's some... I'm not certain I'd want to go on holiday with him. I think he has some problems. But I, what he did was absolutely vital. He, he helped people see just how much we're being lied to, just how unpleasant a lot of what was going on in Iraq and Afghanistan was all about. And the idea we're spending millions of pounds with all the... I mean, you know, we used to have... When I was mayor, we had six police and PCSOs in each of London's 600 wards. That's all been cut back, but we got time to have these people sitting around outside the Ecuadorian embassy, waste of time. Okay, a, a, a second question from Izzy Dead um, about global warming. Mm. Um, how can we combat it? What do we need to do that we're not well, already doing? Well, basically we're not really combating. I said earlier, cities are doing some good work, governments really aren't. And I have to say this, the problem with the debate on climate change is scientists are very cautious. They'll say, well, on the balance of probabilities, there's a strong possibility, until they can prove something 100%. And of course, we can't prove this because it will only be in 100 years' time. We'll know how bad it was. But when I talk privately to climate change scientists, they're much gloomier. I think there's a very real prospect by the end of this century that a large part of human civilization would have collapsed. A catastrophic climate change is coming, and it could be really bad by the middle of the century. The, the, the annoying thing in all of this is solving that problem is easy. We just need to eliminate waste. When you talk about climate change, people oh, you're going to have to grow your own muesli, make your shoes out of tree bark, live in a tent or something. None of that's true. 
I mean, it's the waste we have in our society, not just the energy, but when you go shopping, you come back, each little bit of fruit wrapped up in something and all of this. I mean, the sc I mean, I that, would, that wouldn't be the case if you went to a greengrocer's, for example, no, or no. you went to a, a market, they put it in the brown paper absolutely. bags, they're recyclable. And that's absolutely what and we need to do. And some of those are actually in supermarkets. And also, if I think about it, I mean, the world I grew up in was one where what people valued was their family, workmates, their neighbours. I mean, people are under such pressure now, they don't have that time. And I think that people now, instead of spending time with each other, they just give each other presents a sort of substitute. I, I think back I, when I was a kid, you got, you got a big present at Christmas and your birthday and a few bits and bobs. Now you see kids, loads of stuff, all this packaging. Like we, we've substituted what we own for the value of our relationships. And I think a, a society in which we stop saying we're judged by what we buy and what we own, but by what we do in our community. I mean, that would solve the climate change problem, It'd cut out all this waste and, and squalor. So we, we should all feel in a more community sense Absolutely. and help well, our neighbours? We, well, we evolved as hunter-gatherers in you know, groups of about 15, 20 or 30. Everything was about the relationships within those groups. Now, most people don't know more than a couple of their neighbours in their street. You, you don't, people don't talk to each other on the tube or the, the bus. I mean, we've been cut off from that. And that's what defines our humanity, not what we own, but our relationship with others. Did people used to talk to each other on the bus in, in London? Lot, uh, I mean, it's, you know, if you're because listening we, to your music, then we were British. Not talk. We were British, so we were all a bit um, uh, tight, uh, a bit uptight. But in much of the rest of the world, there is that. Um, but it's all being eroded. People haven't got the time. I mean, well, I talked about all the kids from my school got a job. That job, I mean, paid them enough. They didn't have to do two jobs. They didn't have to, they might do a bit of overtime occasionally. But how many parents now hardly get to see their kids? I mean, they're just, you know, under the most immense pressure. That's wrong. Uh, King of Cheddar Cheese again. The question um, is, how do we stop the spread of misinformation by the right wing? Well, programmes like this really help because you can judge I mean, a person on what they're saying and doing. I mean, my broad view would, I mean, perhaps the most revealing television series I've ever seen um, is Oliver Stone's Untold History of the United States. It's about 10 one-hour programmes, and even I found it shocking. I mean, it, it, we've been even more used and lied to than I thought, and, you know, um, so I do urge people to see that. And books have just come out. Owen Jones, the Guardian columnist, has just bought one about how the inequalities of wealth again. It's all out there. We just got to find ways of making sure people got the time to read it or watch it. Uh, question from Glenn Gadani again. Um, should we stay in the EU? Well, I voted to leave in the referendum back in 1975, and that I think that was wrong. I made a mistake. I, I, d I mean, back in the, the 60s, it's all this other. Is there going to be United States of Europe? Huge enthusiasm. All that's gone. It's just a, a, you know, a collection of markets and administration. It's not going to be ever uplifting. And my, my view is simple. The moment someone can prove to me our economy will do better outside the European Union, there'll be more people in work, I'll vote to leave. But I haven't seen anyone prove that. And I think it's you know, much more likely we'd end up like Norway, which isn't in the EU, has no influence, but in order to be able to trade on fairly equal terms, has to accept all the rules drawn up by the EU. Um, so leaving it, we wouldn't be any better off, I suspect. A question from Izzy, uh, who asks, um, for your views on nuclear disarmament. Oh, we, sh we should never have got the damn things in the first place. I mean, quite interesting, most of the scientists working on the nuclear project back in 1945, once they realised that the Nazis weren't building one. A lot of them said, well, we shouldn't be carrying on. And then after they, it was used against Japan, I mean, an awful lot of those nuclear scientists thought, well, yes, don't get into an arms race. Of course, we did. Now we've got not just Russia and Britain and France, but North Korea, Israel, and several other countries could get them. And you can't use them. If you have a nuclear war, you exterminate the human race, you have a nuclear winter, i.e., everything dies out, you know, catastrophic. 
So it's just madness, and it's particularly mad for us. I mean, France has got its own nuclear weapons under its own control. Ours, because we get them from America, we can only fire them if America allows us to. So we're not really our nuclear weapons, and we're about to spend £80 billion on getting a next generation of them. But, you know, we're basically a satellite of uh, America's nuclear power. So do you think that not having them, that taking them away, hmm. we, there wouldn't be an increased threat? No, no. I mean, the threat we face today is from, you know, extremist groups like I, the Islamic State in Iraq um, and Syria on that border. I mean, now you're not going to deal with that by nuclear weapons. You need to deal with that by educating young Muslims that th th this is taking you back to a medieval period. I, there's nothing, I mean, the teachings of Muhammad, are, I mean, Muhammad in his last sermon just before he died said, you're, you, know, you are not to occupy, oppress, terrorize or convert others. You should get to know one another. I, God created you so you get to know one another. Um, you can't look at what ISIS or Al-Qaeda are saying now and find any relation between that and the teachings of, of Muhammad and Islam. Okay. Um, still more time to get your questions in for Ken. Um, whatever you want to ask him, um, I'm sure he'll answer it. Anything? Well, I mean, until we get into the private life. I remember this, this wonderful thing. The Guardian journalist Decca Aikinhead got so bored doing an interview with Danny Alexander. She said, have you ever had a threesome? And apparently he couldn't speak. He was so stunned to be asked this. Okay, we, we don't know. No, we don't, we no. don't know that. Um, no more comment on that. Um, so from, uh, <coughs> from Nirvan, um, this is about currency, but this is about online currency. Mm. This is about Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think is the future of Bitcoin from what you I know have about no it? idea. I, I have no Bitcoins. I have no intention of having any Bitcoins. I mean, what do you think of the idea, though? Well, the, there's clearly a potential for you know, an awful lot of criminal abuse um, at the back of all of this. I mean, I'm sure we'll move into a world where uh, everything's electronic and you aren't carrying coins around. I mean, if I made a guess, I mean, in 50 years, you'll most likely have a little chip somewhere in your wrist. You'll scan that over the till, and that will all be done that way. And I yeah, mean, it would just make things easier, though, wouldn't it? Oh, you absolutely would. It's I all mean, about you making know, things easier. Literally, I mean, I mean, I'm not suggesting Boris do this because I don't think we're ready for it. But you could take the chip out your Oyster card and insert it in your wrist, so you don't have to keep getting in and out, you know, your your wallet and things like that. But people aren't really ready for that. There'll be a few people ahead of the the pack. There's probably somebody out there who's already done that, and if yeah. they have, do get in touch because we'd <laughs> love to see it. Um, uh, so I think we're going to wrap it up in a few okay. minutes, but um, maybe just a couple of more questions from me. We talked about mm. engaging with um, young voters, mm. young uh, would-be voters in a couple of years' time. You know, there is, uh, you know, the wealth of social media and its ability yeah. to disseminate mm. um, views, mm. images, and video. Um, and I just want to ask you about the upcoming general election. Mm. Obviously. You know, you've um, mm. professed a lot of praise for Ed Miliband. Mm. You think he's the right leader mm. for the Labour Party. Um, but do you think he's going to win the general oh, election? Yeah, and yeah. will he win it outright? I've got several bets on that with loads of people already. Um, I think they'll get a majority. Um, and I think people want a majority government rather than another coalition. I mean, this coalition hasn't really worked. I do think he'll, he'll, he, he will win. And it's, that's not just because I hope that. I mean, Bob Worcester, who's been a pollster, he ran Morrie from the late 60s. I mean, when I asked him the same question, um, he just said, yes, there'll be a Labour majority. If you analyse the data, no Tory government has ever increased its vote uh, a subsequent election. And so Cameron would have to break a pattern that goes back nearly 80 years of always a Tory vote is either static or declines when they come up for re-election, because they've usually not been very nice to people. Um, now, I know you recently re-elected to the... Yeah, the, in the Labour's energy. Energy So yeah. you've, you've got sort of, sort of work and going on there. But, I, you know, we've talked about Boris, we've mm. talked about being, being mm. London Mayor mm. in the past, you, but you've talked quite affectionately about it. Mm. Oh, I love Have it. you not go back? Well, so you're I not mean, sort of, you know, ditch the my, LBC... My wife has, has show done a career change. Yeah. She's... Jack just got a degree and she's going to be a lecturer, most probably somewhere 
college in London. I got a 10 year old and 11 year old, they'll be in their first years at, at secondary school, so I'm the house husband. I'd be 70. Can you not, you, you balance the jobs, <coughs> can't you? People balance jobs and not the, the both incredible have demands jobs. of actually looking after kids, no, no. Um, when I was mayor, my wife did the bulk of all of that. It's my turn now to do it for her while she develops her career. Do you want to be mayor again? I'd love to. I'd love to run the whole world. But, I mean, you've got to recognise I will be 71 at the next mayor election. I, Ken Livingston, I want to run the whole world. <laughs> well, you couldn't do any worse than the current lot, could you? OK. On that note, we'll leave it for now. That was our latest live interview with Ken Livingston, former London mayor, former MP. Uh, his views on lots of things there. We have more live interviews coming up um, next week. We will let you know who they are with, but we've got some very exciting interviewees coming up. And of course, whoever they are, you're welcome to ask questions. So get in touch. Tweet us, or even if it's a live interview of somebody and you want us to ask a question, get in touch that way. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Ken. I enjoyed it. <laughs>